from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Jade Washaw, Ramsey personality, best-selling author of the book, Money's Not a Math Problem. She's my co-host today as we answer your questions at 888-825-5225. Liddell is with us in Memphis. Hi, Liddell. How are you? How are you doing today, Mr. Ramsey? Better than I deserve. How can we help, sir? I uh, just got a quick question. Um... Recently, just got um, my car repossessed. Um, yes, sir. And I'm trying to see what's my um, next course of action. Um, I've been watching you guys for a while. and just trying to see my next course of action. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I come back from that um, pretty much? Wow. So you just woke up and it was gone out of the driveway? Uh, no, sir. I actually seen them when they actually pulled it. Oh, okay. All right. That is a... An emotional experience, isn't it? Yes, sir. It feels, it feels like somebody's stealing something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. Yeah. I think that's why these repo guys get so much crap off of the customer. It's because they're like slipping up in your driveway, taking your stuff out of your driveway. It's it's dangerous. It's wow. Yes, I'm sir. sorry, man. Something. So how much was the car payment? The car payment was um, about 584 bucks. Mm-hmm. How much did you owe on the car? Uh, it was about three, maybe three grand on it. It, 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 it. I definitely went over maybe a hundred days on it. Just three thousand dollars is all you owed. Yes, sir. Oh wow! And what was the car worth? Um, I'm from what my documents I'm looking at. I, I believe in the range of about twenty, twenty grand or something like that. Oh, so you had bought this car, almost paid it off, or put a bunch down. So what happened that you were not able to make the payment? Tell us what happened in your situation. Um, really just, I, you know, just really negligence on me and just, uh, and I lost my job in November, which is was, was my main means of, um, really my, the, the main means of employment that I, so that I could mm-hmm. pay the bill, but I lost that job in uh, November mm-hmm. of um 2023 and just uh from there just um uh, covering my other stuff and you know and just really just <laughs> neglecting the deal almost i would say uh not, how long, not how long ago not, did this how long ago did this happen um it was they, they pulled it like like a week like a week or two ago okay have you talked to them about paying it off and picking it up yes sir, i have and they they had told me that i would have to pay the full amount the three thousand dollars the three thousand plus, you know, what's what's the car owed on the car? Which was, I think, the amount they told me was like twenty one. If I wanted to recover. It. Oh, you're saying so? I see. So oh, the missed you're, you payments didn't owe were three thousand dollars. You were behind three thousand. Yes, yes, I see. Yes, sir, I was okay. behind $3, but you yes, owe yes, twenty one. And the yes, car's sir. worth well, twenty. It was it was it was at like eighteen before they added the fees and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, but you owe as much as it's worth. Yes, sir. Okay. Got right. it. Oh, man. Are you back to work? Are you doing anything? What are you driving in the last two weeks? Uh, nothing right now uh, because I just I didn't have anything uh, yeah. pretty much saved up to, to, to for, for, for another means. Are you single? So I'm trying to. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. All right. So what, you've been sitting at home for two weeks. How are you getting around? Well, I've really just been applying for jobs, and if anything came up, I, I, I could, like, Uber or something like that at the moment. But What are you doing for work, and what are you earning uh, currently? I, wor- I, wor- I was working at GameStop. That was, like, my last recent job, but I just recently um, wasn't even there anymore. I only was working for, like, two days a week, you know, something like this. So By choice or because they didn't have the hours? Uh, just didn't have the hours. I would say I just had came in on the job. Mm. Okay, so what about I now? Go, I re- now I'm not working at all. Listen, if I'm you, um, you know, I, I do think that everybody kind of has an ideal work situation in their mind of something that they're shooting for. And sometimes you can hold off thinking, I'm just going to hold off until I get the job that I want. But in your case, right. you can't afford, you literally can't afford to do that for many reasons, your self-confidence and 
you know, you need cash. Like there's many reasons to take any job until you get the job. And one of those things is self-confidence. The more you sit at home, the more you're going to feel some type of way about yourself and what you're able to accomplish. But if you go out and get any job and take the first job, number one, it puts a little money back in your pocket, gives you a little boost of feeling good about yourself. Like, do you have a friend that works construction, Liddell? Um, No, sir. Not that I know. I have a friends that work like the railroad companies and stuff like that maybe yeah call him and ask him if they'll put you on and he can give you a ride to work for two weeks till you can get a check and get you a thousand dollar car yes sir okay your car that got repoed we'll circle back to that is the least of your problems right now i'm more worried about you eating and paying rent and keeping the lights on and getting your life back on track than i am that stupid car it's kind of good that that car's gone because it was a real hanging over your head problem so here, look, I'll, sorry, I'll go ahead and give you the full answer on the car so you know what you're looking at, but let's focus 99% of your efforts on finding a ride to work and getting some kind of work going 50, 60, 70 hours a week right now. Go crazy, man, and, and make you some quick, easy money somewhere, uh, just, just working like a maniac and bum rides off of friends for two weeks and then go get you um or catch an uber whatever you got to do but but go then go get you a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar car and pay cash for it okay is that a plan yes sir that's that okay. definitely a plan now the the other car we're just going to let them have it okay and then here's what's going to happen they're going to sell it on a repo lot you owe 21 with all the fees they're going to sell it for 12 14 thousand Okay, mm-hmm. that's going to be uh, six months from now, maybe. And then they're going to come knocking on the door, not literally, but they're going to send you notes and start threatening you that you owe them yes, the sir. difference. It's called the deficit, 21 minus whatever they sell it for. Let's call it 14, so you owe them seven. Okay. okay? When they do that, they will settle that for about 20 cents on the dollar so you probably could settle that old bad debt the deficit on the repo for somewhere around 1500 bucks when it comes due okay i'm not going to be far off it might be a thousand it might be two thousand but it's somewhere in that range it's not you're not going to owe them ten thousand dollars they're going to come at you for seven to ten thousand dollars but you can settle that for pennies on the dollar you understand what i'm saying Yes, sir, I understand. But in the meantime, obviously, and that's probably going to be a year before you hear from them on that. Okay. So we're going to put that repo as nasty as it is in the back of your mind and try to get to work and get your current life straightened out as fast as you possibly can here. I think that's what's going to matter is what Jade said. Because the way you feel about yourself and, and the sense of desperation, the knot in your stomach and knot in your throat, I've been there, man. It's no fun. It's terrorizing terrifying and so um yeah I, I i you know i want you to get some cash coming in that place then go get you a little beat up car that's reliable and get your life started back and then pile up some cash to get ready for when they come at you later on this this is the ramsey show You know, it doesn't take a degree in statistics to realize that this one stinks. 93% of undergraduate private student loans are co-signed. So when you're delinquent and drowning in private student loan debt, mom or dad or Uncle Joe is stuck in that financial stress along with you. But there is a way out. Why refi? Why refi offers a custom refinancing option with a fixed rate loan based on your ability to pay. And the average interest rate why refi offers is 3.9%, which can significantly reduce your monthly payment and decrease your total cost. Why refi refinances your defaulted private student loans that other places won't touch. And I trust them to help you get out of debt. So don't be another statistic. In the student loan swamp. Contact YRefi at 844-2-RAMSEY or go to yrefi.com slash Ramsey. That's 844-2-RAMSEY or the letter Y then R-E-F-Y dot com slash Ramsey.
Jade Washaw, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're glad you are here. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Jay is with us in New York City. Hi, Jay. How are you? Hi, Jay. I mean, sorry. Hi, Dave. Hi, Jade. How you doing? Doing good. Good, Good, man. Good to have you. How can we help? Um, Well, so I'll just give you a little background story. I'm like more than four years removed from college, graduated with an engineering degree, um, working out here in New York um, as a GC. Um, and yeah, I, I moved out my parents' house, um, mainly because of taking your advice, you know, wanna, wanted to set out in the world and, you know, make sure, you know, I'm not freeloading. <laughs> right. Um, so, I, my question today is, in doing that, I don't know if I prematurely bought a property. Um, I ended up buying a one-bedroom a few years after uh, the, renting my first place. And now I've been, you know, getting hit with increases on, in, like, maintenance and HOA payments and just been hit with uh, an assessment. <laughs> um and so I'm just wondering how I can cash flow this assessment that's kind of been set before uh, me a couple of days ago. Uh, the amount's like sixteen thousand. Um, For what? Uh, so I think in New York we we're doing a uh, most buildings do like a local law eleven like facade restoration um, for like older buildings. Because I bought a pre-war, um, and so that's kind of what they we owe like the contractor. I think or the building does like six hundred thousand, and they're saying our maintenance payments aren't enough to compensate that. Mm-hmm. So before they hired the contractor, they did not get this approved by the HOA. Because I mean, if you hire the contractor for money you don't have. And you're running the HOA, then uh, you got to know that you're getting ready to slap the occupants with an assessment. So you had no yeah. notice of this before now. Yeah. So I mean, when I bought the place, I, you know, I did my due diligence, tried to ask about, you know, the finances of the building because it looked like this work was underway even when I bought it two years ago. Um, and you know, when I was in the process of doing that. I wasn't notified that this was like a potential and, you know, I raised the red flag, you know, I listened to your advice occasionally on like high HOAs, low HOAs, and I raised the red flag cause it did seem pretty high. Um, but you know, kind of shopping around, it seemed, yeah. What do you make? Lower end, uh, 98,000. Okay. What's the, what's the unit worth today? Um, Based off like the last probably like uh, 150. Okay, and what do you owe on it? I put like 25 down. I pro- I owe like a hundred thousand. Okay, so you you, but you haven't had it. Uh, you haven't actually looked at comparable sales lately. Where'd you get the 150? Um, I, I assumed uh, based off what the actual value was um, when I got it two years ago. Yeah, that ain't anything um, to do with the value today. I mean, it could be yeah. worth, it could be worth 250 and you wouldn't know it based on that. No, so, I wouldn't know. Yeah, you need, to, you need to do some research and find out what they're actually could sell for today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because it sounds like it might be a good idea to sell it because everything you've described about this has not been fun. Yeah. All I've heard, every, every mention of this was... Uh, well, I probably bought something I shouldn't have bought. Well, it's a problem. Well, I thought there was a thing on the front end, and a bunch of HOA fee increases, and then they hit me with the assessment. And every single time, your voice is just talking about it. your voice just sounds whipped. I mean, you sound like God, man. I'm just this thing's awful. It's 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 consuming a lot of your calories, isn't it? It is. I, I've also like been renovating the place, kind of getting it up to um, the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. Because um, you know I'm in. Uh, I'm in the GC world, so I've been kind of using my resources there. To How much does it, it take to finish stuff. it to get to get it ready to put on the market and sell it? Uh, 
Well, I want to renovate the kitchen next, so... No, I don't want you to renovate the kitchen next. What, is it torn up right now? Uh, no. Okay, it's not. so you can put it on the market today. Yeah. What's wrong with selling it? I... There's a stipulation here, like, when I sell it, there's, like, um a flip tax, they like to call it, where I think a certain percentage of the sale goes back to the building. Um, what percentage? I, just, I would say around, like, 40% is in my head right now. Oh, bull crap. That's crazy. Yeah. That didn't happen. No, you're right. you're confused. Okay, you need to dig in and find out what's really going on here. You got all these demons running around your head, and you none of them got a name. So you need you need to get some clarity on some of the information. Uh, there's not a forty percent kickback to the building when you sell a condo or a co-op in New York City. I mean, it's just not. Um, now they're probably going to get the sixteen k out of the closing from the assessment to be able to do the transfer, mm -hmm. but you at least got rid of the problem then. So I, I think you need to do some investigation. Uh, it doesn't sound like you want to sell it because when I brought it up, you're like, oh. so I don't know. I can't tell with you. But mm -hmm. um, he also didn't say how much money he's put in so far. Yeah, it do doesn't matter to me. It sounds like there's nothing here that's fine. Yeah. It's a pre-war building. It's all screwed up. They're doing redoing the facade. He's trying to redo the kitchen. It's redo, 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 redo. And extra fees, extra fees, extra fees, extra fees, extra fees. This thing sounds like a money pit. So, I mean, you do what you want to do, man. But I got to tell you, all real estate is not a good deal. Mm -hmm. Real estate as a category is a good idea. But there's some serious dogs in the in the pound here and this one sounds like it could be <laughs> could be on the list so it's either that or you start scratching together money pay the 16 and then scratch together the money and do the kitchen but you don't do the oh. kitchen till you take care of the 16 but after you do the kitchen and the 16 you're still going to face the 40 percent kickback if that's really there i don't think it is i think you're confused um and after you do that, then there's going to be something else. And it sounds like this HOA is poorly run, so expect other increases and other situations to come at you here because you bought into a mess, it sounds like. So either live with the expectation that this is a constant flow of money um, or get out. Do one of the two. Do one of the two. But you can't live there and then act like you're surprised anymore. There's nothing here that's surprising anymore. It, 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 the pattern is established. Absolutely. I'd get out instantly. And if he doesn't make any money off of it, then it's a lesson learned. Yep. Our question of the day comes from Catlin in Ar or Caitlin in Arkansas. She says, I'm a divorced mom to two boys, and my ex doesn't provide any help financially. I work from home and earn about $40,000 a year and have the proceeds from the sale of our home and a HYSA from which I draw about $15,000 a year. My only debt is $16,000 on my car, and my payment is $260 a month. I could earn more if I got a job outside of the home, but with child care for kids, it would end up being a wash. I have 50000 in savings, and that earns me about 3000 a year. The kids, needs, the kids need clothes and shoes, and all their activities add up so quickly. I don't want them to be able, I don't want them to not be able to pursue their interest. Between rent, a few streaming services, food, car payments, and insurance, I just can't make it all work without drawing regularly from the house money, which I need to keep for security and comfort. How do single parents budget? Um, that's a good question. Number one, single moms are superheroes and su single dads are superheroes. I don't know how you guys do it. Um, I'd be asking about child support. Number one. Yeah. That's my first question. Why isn't this guy paying? He's I, got I, kids. I have a judge help him with his attitude on that. And number two, looking for something that you can do part time from home in while you're home with the kids. In addition to this, and kids activities are not necessary for life, even if they think they are. Mm hmm. So that's way down on the list yeah. after it's interesting you put those before your food, car payment and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would pick up the every dollar budget and get started on a detailed type budget. And I think you're going to find some money. This is the Ramsey show.
your home is probably the biggest purchase you'll ever make. And with the real estate market like it is now, you'll need a mortgage company you can trust. That's Churchill Mortgage. You guys, buying a home is not a button push. It's a process. It takes building a relationship with an expert who will dig into the details and give you peace of mind without busting your budget. Churchill is one of the highest rated lenders in the country. And they're Ramsey trusted because they do what's right for you. Go to churchillmortgage.com to get started. Shaw Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Stephen is with us in Dallas. Hi, Stephen. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, so my wife and I are getting ready to kind of go through a uh, life transition. Um, my wife is a teacher, and she's wanting to stay home next year to be with our um, almost one-year-old. Yay! Um, and so we're just... Um, yeah, we're both really excited. Um, we're just trying to figure out what we can do to kind of prepare um, ourselves for it. Um, a little bit of background. Um, we took a little bit of, like, some um, financial course when we did a marriage prep through our church, um, but it didn't really go in-depth in finances. Um, and so after that, I kind of took the reins of finances, and we're new listeners, so after a couple episodes, I realized, oh, I it shouldn't be me doing all of this. And then we talked about it. We both want to get on the same page with our finances and Good. Um, get out of debt and kind of get ready. So we're just trying to figure out what we can do. So do you have an every dollar budget? Uh, we do not. Okay, that's step one. And we'll make sure we get you hooked up with the information you need on that. But what I would start with is I'd open up my every dollar budget. And if I know it's going to just be your income. I'm going to start doing the budget with just your income and see where you land. And that's going to give you a picture of what life is going to be like with one income. That's step one. Okay. And so what do you earn right now? Uh, joint, we're at about 110. Um, myself, um, I'm at about 67. Okay. What um, she do? What she do? Where, you what? asked where she You said she's it? a teacher, didn't you? Yeah, she's okay. a teacher. Yeah, okay. Okay, so she's the other 57, basically. Yeah. Okay. And so um, then my next question is, what baby step are you guys on? Um, so we just started looking at that, and we haven't started the baby step, so we're still in conversation about it. Okay. Um, but we have um, in debt right now, we're about 31000 in debt. Okay. Um, we have about 41000 in savings. Um, so we're talking about... Um, just using what we have in savings to wipe out our debt and then we'll be debt free. Okay, that's great. I would go with that plan. I mean, that is our plan. So uh, you guys need to talk about that and get on board with the same plan. But if you're asking for our advice, it is that. I'd say take that 41,000, clear out the debt, that leaves you 10,000 left and mm -hmm. add whatever you need to that to call it six months of expenses. If you're going down to one income, I would definitely, you know, we say save up three to six months. In your case, there's one income, you've got a new baby, I'm saving up six months of expenses uh, between now and when you're making this transition. And that would be my plan. And then, of course, you have to look and see, okay, what does this mean? Looking at the budget, what does this mean for us? Because life is going to change. You're living on half of what you were living on, which is a big deal. Right. Are you homeowners? Um, so we are. We're actually in the process of selling our house. Because um, when we found out we were pregnant, we kind of fell into the trap of, Oh yeah, we need to go buy a house, and we definitely overbought. Okay. Um, and so we got a good deal on a rental that we're um, that we're really happy with, and um, we're wanting to kind of settle in here. And then um, once we get finances a little bit more situated, and we're both on the same page, then we we look at um, the housing market again. What are you going to make on the sale? Anything? <laughs> we're not sure yet. We're hoping to break even um, and just kind of clear the note. Um, okay. but with our, the, we had a meeting with our realtor yesterday and, 
um, yeah, that's kind of the best hope we have right now. Stephen, you're making really good, big decisions to be able to hit the big goal of her being at home. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're, you're, you're looking for more information. You looked online. You talked to us. You're gathering up. You looked at, you're considering talking about paying off the debt. You're learning to work together. You put the house on the market because we can't afford it on my salary, and you be at home because this doesn't work. The math doesn't work. So you're, you're doing all the right things. You're making all the right moves. There's a lot of wisdom in every move I see you making. Mm-hmm. So keep, keep all of that up, and we'll have Christian pick up. We'll get you signed up for the Every Dollar Premium. The, folks, that's our world-class budgeting app it helps you manage money the ramsey way it's ios android online uh smart dollar is free if you want to start it out that way and and you can immediately see where you stand get organized personalize your budget stop overspending save more money if you wanted to connect to your bank and drop your like your debit card stuff directly into your budget it's very smooth and very easy there's a small charge for that, and, and that's the every dollar premium process. So if you're new, we're going to give you a long-term financial roadmap in every dollar. Track your net worth. Track your debt-free date. Track your retirement date. Your baby step progress. And we're going to proactively coach you through this. So I, it's an app on iOS, an app on Android, or desktop at everydollar.com. Go get it for free. We're going to give it to you, Stephen, and guys, help you guys hit that goal of your wife being at home with the babies, which is where where you're wanting to be and we want to help you get there if that's that's your goal that's what this does so what it amounts to is this okay budget is a cuss word people use the budget like it's a cuss word like i don't want to be on a budget because budget as rachel says budget people aren't fun but (laughs) budget is a punishment that's what i used to think but for an adult that puts what numbers they want to put on their budget Mm -hmm. the budget's not telling them what to do they're telling their budget what to do to accomplish goals that matter more than their short-term Friday night feelings. And so all a budget is is you're doing your money on purpose. That's all it is. And so John Maxwell says a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. That's all it is. Mm. And, I, you know, you get to decide. If you want your budget to be punishment, you can decide that. If you want your budget to have a lot of wiggle room, you can decide that. You mm. write down what numbers you want to write down. But what we found is is that people, when they start writing it down, they go, eh, that's kind of stupid. I don't need to do that. And you start making judgment calls as soon as you're writing it down. You know, mm. I got it. We got it. We got to back off on that. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. When you actually look at the numbers, the numbers will yell at you and tell you to straighten your act up, you know. And... So I don't have to tell you all that stuff. The, and the budget doesn't tell you anything. It's like when you were four years old and you were fighting with your sister. You're not the boss of me. Remember that? You're not the boss of me. <laughs> well, the budget is not the boss of you. You're the boss of the budget until you get it built and you're building it to be the boss of you. But you're the boss of the boss. So you're good. <laughs> Everything's good. So check it out. Every dollar, it'll get you going. All the correlation of all the data we have of 30 years of doing this, 10 million people going through Financial Peace University, the ones that do a zero-based budget, every dollar has an assignment before the month begins and agree on it with your spouse, are the ones that achieve their financial goals. No one accidentally wins the Super Bowl. Winning is not an accident. It's a series of intentional acts, and that's what this is. Win-win. Hey, if you want to check out the premium version, you can put in everydollar.com slash jade, and I'll give you $15 off a premium. I still need a slash. You've got a slash still. And How I did that slash. happen? I don't know. We have a jade slash. We need a Dave slash. How much How much should my slash be worth? Oh, I'm going to go with. You might, should it be more or less? <laughs> I she's, think yours should be totally. She's got her name totally. after the slash. Your name is before the slash. My That's, name's before th- the slash. Thank you. That's right. Ramsey Solutions. Okay. <laughs> uh, funny. All right. So Jade has a slash after my name. There we go. Yes. <laughs> I, my ego is feels you better, feel better already. Now? Feeling I better already. I think I'm already. going to survive now. <laughs> yeah. So Jade, you've been doing these uh, webinars, you and George and Rachel, a lot on uh-huh. the on building out your every dollar budget. What's the question you're getting in the comments? Because we take questions live during Mm -hmm. the webinars. What are y'all getting the most about putting together? Is it still people feel like the budget is bossing them around? Not really. We kind of identified four main questions. And the first one is, how do I even get started? A lot of people are feeling the tension of, I don't feel like I make enough money to make a budget. Mm. And you kind of spoke to that, which is, 
yeah, let the numbers talk and tell you what you need to do. Because yeah. for some of us, if it feels that way, you might need an extra job. You need an extra job. Or some of us just need to pull back on the lifestyle that we've had. And that's what's eaten up all your money. And so kind of walking people through the zero based budget and mm-hmm. how you're giving each dollar an assignment and be open to what the numbers tell you. <laughs> there we go. You that's know? how that works. This is the Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything, from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Visit Blinds.com to get up to 45% off. That's Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. Jade Washaw, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thanks for being with us, America. Luke is in Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Luke. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? So I kind of use uh, a unique situation here. Uh, 22 years old, household income of 90000 We inherited inherited six acres of land and decided to build a house on it. We don't have any debt. We have not taken any loans on the house. I've built it so far where you got the roof, walls, and siding, and uh, almost done with utilities. But uh, our goal is that uh, I pay for all the bills, and then my wife, she pays for all the uh, materials for the house. My question is, should I uh, take what's excess of my income after the bills and throw it towards the house or put it towards retirement? Okay, you're trying to build a house out of your pocket, and so far you have, Mm -hmm. but you and your wife have separate finances. Uh, Well, we work together for the finances, but... Not really. uh, Not really. You've delegated part of it to her and part of it to you. You don't have one pile. So you need one pile of money. Her money, your money is our money. One big pile. Out of that pile, what is our first goal? I would assume it's to finish the house, isn't it? Yes, sir. So what does it take to finish the house money-wise? How much money? We're looking at uh, probably about ten grand left. we got drywall, insulation, and paint. Okay. And how long, if you pile all your money, you and your wife, our money in one pile, how long does it take you to come up with ten grand? Uh, well, probably a month or two. Yeah. Okay. So let's finish the house. And Sounds then, good. then you may need to make sure you have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses, and then take fifteen percent of your household income, our okay. income, and start that towards retirement. That's baby step four. But you're going to be living in a paid-for house. Mm-hmm. That's nice. That's awesome. You got this acreage, and you Thank built you. the house. You, you got a lot of sweat in it, and you're going to have a bunch of yeah. equity, right? Oh yeah, for sure. What's this finished product going to be worth? Acreage and house total. We're hoping for 250. Good, very cool. And you said you're 26. 
22. 22? Wow. Okay, wow. And your household income, if we put both of your money in one pile, is how much a year? 90,000. How much? 90,000. 90,000. That's the two of you combined. Okay, good. Yes, I make 62, she makes 28. Okay. okay, cool. Perfect, yeah. So let's take 15% of 90000 after we get the emergency fund in place, and you're sitting on a $250,000 house, you're going to be millionaires before you're 30. Woo! That's exciting. Isn't that fun? Mm-hmm. I hope they take your advice and put their money in one pile. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, so um, there's, yeah, th- there's just so much data that says when you do that, that your higher probability of winning at marriage, winning at relationship, winning at everything. Um, and let's circle back and say this, nothing to do with Luke's call, but just this, because mm-hmm. we get so much bull crap on social media about telling people to put their money together. Um, you should be independent. No, you shouldn't be independent if you're married. Mm. That's a dumb butt idea. This is how your marriage doesn't work because you're so strung out on you that you're worthless as a spouse. So that that's the problem. So, no, you don't need to be independent. You need to be one. The preacher said, and now you are one. One. Uno. Unity. All in one. And so if we know, and we do know, that the data tells us in America today, the number one cause of divorce is money fights and money problems. The number one solution to that is learning to dream together and put our money together and handle our problems and our challenges and our opportunities and our dreams together. That is the solution where you don't have money problems cause divorce. If we have the solution to the number one cause of divorce, why are you arguing with us? That's just dumb. <laughs> because people out there are dumb, and we will always have a show for that reason. So there it is. Not all people out there are dumb, but enough of them are dumb, but we will always have this show. Are they dumb, Dave, or do they do dumb things? They're ignorant. Ignorance is different that. than dumb. That's good. Ignorant is, that. I don't know how. Ignorance, I, and I, there's things I'm ignorant of, by the way. Yeah. I, I don't know how. I used to know when I was a young redneck, I used to know how to work on a car. But now a car looks like a spaceship when I open the hood. <laughs> and so I can't even, I don't know if I could jump the thing and get a jumper cable on it nowadays without blowing it up. So, you know, yeah. uh, um, so, but the data so is I, there. I don't know how to work on that car. Mm-hmm. I, it doesn't mean I'm dumb. It means I'm You're ignorant. ignorant. Yes. I don't know how to do that. But then don't argue with experts when you're ignorant because it makes you look dumb. <laughs> I'll take that, dude. I'll take that. <laughs> Golly. Wow. And Luke was doing none of that. Luke's a sharp young guy. No. At 22, man, he's got it going on, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, most definitely. I don't even. I was nowhere near that, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, don't even, I don't even want to talk about it. Jason was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hi, Jason. How are you? Hey, guys. How are y'all? Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. What's up? Good. Good. Hey, I just got a quick question for you. Um, I'll give you a quick uh, quick rundown of my situation. I'm, I'm trying to decide if I should sell my house. I uh, live about an hour outside of the Carolina metros right now. and I'm, I'm planning to make a move this summer. Um, I'm self-employed. I sell real estate. And uh, so in my new market, I'm going to have to um, kind of start from the ground up. Um, I'm near the end of baby step two. Um if this move wasn't happening, I'd be done probably by June or July, uh, maybe August. Um, the flip side, uh, so the question is basically... Where are you going to live when you I move? A, I'm going to rent. Okay. And so yeah, your so question is whether rent. to keep your house or not? Yeah. Uh, oh, so sell like it. Unique position, no, just, just sell. Uh, yeah, I bought... You don't need to be a renter okay. and be a landlord. That's bass backwards. Well, <laughs> that was okay. risky, Dave. That was very well, risky. that's... Uh, what I needed to know. Yeah, I mean, really, think about it. That's backwards. You don't want to do that. So no, you need to um, get get uh, you know, get, you're in the real estate business. You're going to get plenty of opportunities to own a property and live in a house that you pay cash for, and or buy it and then get it paid off as quick as you can. Hanging onto this boat anchor that represents your former life out in the burbs when you're moving into the metro and having to deal with that while you're trying to learn to sell real estate and trying to get your business moving. Nah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's where my mind was, and I thought that was right. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, you're you're right on track, man. You're right on track. So <laughs> there you go. Here's the thing. It's interesting. Um, 
real estate is such a, an emotional topic because it, it has these two strange elements to it. Strange element number one is it is an excellent way to build wealth when you do it right as a part of your long-term plan. Right. That get, then gets confused with it's always smart no matter what. That's a good point, Dave. And it's not. Sometimes real estate, doing a real estate deal in the wrong situation in your life could be not, you know, in Jason's, it's just, it's just a bad idea. But in other people's, it's even way over into the stupid zone. Yeah, for sure. And so real estate is, it's weird. It, it is because it's a blessing when you do it right, that gives everybody permission to do it even wrong mm. and it becomes a curse. Yeah. And I think also the other thing that I think we're fighting now is so many people had properties that they locked in at a better interest rate. And so then when life moves them, they feel like, yeah, it's a good deal. Maybe I shouldn't get rid of it. Even though I'm moving, I should keep it. It's like this weird yeah, attachment well, to it. It's like, because real estate is good, mm -hmm. I can't, everything I do with it is going to be smart. Right. It just falls in line. And it's like, no, it's not going to be smart. <laughs> and, you know, it's not smart. The only way that, you know, it, it, no, there's a good time to cut real estate loose. Mm -hmm. There's a good time for it to not be there. And buying, buying real estate, you can't afford. Buying a house, you can't afford. We had that earlier in the hour. That's right. So we got to sell the house because mom wants to come home and not be a teacher and be a full-time mom. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But we got to sell the house. We bought a house we can't afford. So it's not a blessing anymore. That's right. It's a curse. It's a problem. Yes. So doing it wrong or keeping it wrong or because real estate's good, mm -hmm. it's not always good. Yeah. Because, and it's not that real estate is, actually real estate is always good. It's the life situation you're in doesn't match up with owning mm -hmm. real estate right then. Yeah. And so it's not always good to keep your old house and rent it. Matter of fact, it seldom is. Yeah. Very seldom. This is The Ramsey Show. of Ramsey Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Jade Washaw, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author of the Ramsey Quick Read. Money is not a math problem real reason you're broke and what to do about it. She's my co-host today. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Renee is in Nashville. Hi, Renee. How are you? I am doing better than I deserve, Dave. Good. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can I help? <laughs> well, I'm really glad that you took my call. Um, uh, and hi, Jade. Hi. Uh, I have a lot of plants, too. <laughs> yes. So um, my thing is, is that I, I'm needing some clarification on how to get a mortgage uh, through church home mortgage with a manual underwriting and everything without having a credit score. So background, I am, I will be debt free uh, in August. Um, I have 75, uh, 70, seven, 7,500 left to pay off on my consumer debt out of $22,074.75, and it will be done in August, be done with baby step, step three um, before January 25, and I will be starting to pay my house off, and by my calculations, I will have the house paid off um, in two years, so uh, 2027, the house will be paid off. Um, I want to move. I hate my house. I hate everything about it including the location. Um, I should have never bought the house. Um, 
Uh, and uh, it was actually a curse to me in the beginning because I did not have my three to six months emergency fund uh, saved up. Mm-hmm. And, and Murphy came in in a big, huge storm, everything. I had to replace so many things in the house. And I know better now. Now, I know I will make a profit when I sell the house, but I'm probably going to have to get a mortgage considering I don't know what the market is going to be doing. What will you, you when you sell the house, what will you come away with? Um, I don't know, maybe about uh, 2000 uh, two hundred thousand uh, dollars, okay. maybe. And then, um, what would you want to purchase the... the next house for? What What's your range? It's two years from now. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. This is about two and a half years from now, okay. maybe three, uh, because I really want to renovate. Because I would be embarrassed to sell this house to anybody. In got you. To so you've got a you've got a little journey <laughs> here. You've got a little timeline in front of you. So. Your biggest yes. fear is, is this true, Jade and Dave? Can you actually buy a house with a zero credit score when the time comes? Is that your question? Yes. And I have been listening to to uh, George Campbell's book. By the way, please tell him he did an amazing job on the audio book. Absolutely huh. love mm-hmm. it. We agree. Uh, and in the, in, in the book, he said that he bought a house with a zero, uh, with zero credit score and the interest rate that he got was the same interest rate that somebody with a perfect score credit score would get. That's sure. true. That's um, right. Same here, by the way. Okay. Um, and on a 15 year oh. fixed rate, which tends, yeah. tends to get you a better interest rate as well. So it's okay. all true. Um, it's absolutely all true. Just know, you know, if you're doing uh, zero credit score manual underwriting, I mean, there's there's limitations. You can't just borrow to the moon and back, you know, right? So, you know, ha- going in with some cash and then adding, you know, whatever you're going to add to that, that's great. And I think it's one of those things, I'll be honest with you, when I entered the baby steps, Renee, there were a couple of things that I pushed back. It was like my logic just hadn't caught up yet. It was very hard for me to accept that you can actually buy a car in cash. And it was very hard for me. Mm. I remember being like, Dave, don't let me down because I'm about to have zero credit score. And I want to know that this works. And there is part of that, that you just walk through the process. And even though you've heard everybody say it and say it and say it until you experience it for yourself, then you go, oh my gosh, this really does work. This is real. People yeah, do that's this. That's what scares me is not having a credit score. I, I'm, I'm never buying, I'm not get, never getting credit cards again. See, here's, what, here's I, the I thing. Here's that. the thing, okay? When you say out loud, what scares me is not having a credit score, what you're really saying is, I'm worried that I won't have a good life without debt. Okay. It's the same thing. Because there's only one thing the credit score is used for, and that's getting debt. Mm-hmm. So yes. I, I'm worried I can't have a, a good life without debt. That's what you're saying when you're saying, I'm worried about not having a credit score. Now, what you do need to do on a technical basis is make sure you don't have any open accounts, even with zero balances. So if you've got old credit cards that are still open, but zero balances, you need to close the account completely because an open account uh, ding in that crib, uh, ringing the bell over at the credit bureau is going to keep your score there, even if it's a zero balance. So, so you need to close, okay, so close all debt accounts completely down, including the 7500 one. As soon as it's gone, you need to make sure mm-hmm. it's closed. And then they it takes them about a quarter, maybe two quarters, to notify the credit bureau. Uh, that they that the account no longer exists, and when you have no active credit accounts of any kind, about six months later, typically, your credit score it becomes indeterminable or zero, and that is the goal. And what I decided because I didn't have a choice, uh, you had a choice, because I went broke, was that the great FICO is not worthy of my adoration. The great FICO is not worthy of my worship. And I don't need to bring the great FICO God offerings of interest and other stupid things to have a good life. Don't worship at false idols because this is a false idol. It does not provide you. It's not an indication you're good with money. 
It's not an indication of your net worth. It's not an indication of your income. 100% of the variables in the algorithm that create a FICO score have to do with your interaction with debt. That's right. How much debt you have, what kinds of debt you have, what percentage of the debt available to you that you're using. Yep. It's how all long you've how had much you've been playing kissy face with the bank. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And so when you, so it, you, you could get a million dollar inheritance. It doesn't change your FICO score one dime. You could get a million dollar raise at work. It doesn't change your FICO score one dime. So the point is, it is not a measure of financial health. It is a measure of how much you've been playing kissy face with the bank. How much debt you love. That's an I love debt score. And I love debt thoroughly is what an 800 score says. It says I have paid them so much interest because I just love banks. I think they're awesome and I want to give them my money. That's what an 800 score says. That's right. It's an I, it's, a, it's a Hallmark card to the banking industry. <laughs> Instead, I want to give them a salute. (laughs) This is The Ramsey Show. Statistics show that half of Americans don't have enough life insurance or they don't have any at all. I don't understand this, John. Why don't people want to take care of their family? They think they're going to die or something? Well, I used to be one of those guys. I didn't even think about it. And one of my buddies said, hey, the only reason to not have life insurance is if you hate your wife and kids. And I immediately went and got term life insurance. That's a gut punch. And oh, you're telling me and for, for decades, Dave, I've sat across people who've lost a spouse. They've lost somebody important to them. Me and too. They don't know what to do next. Me right? too. I mean, it's you're going to have a crisis here, and you know you got two options while you're sitting and talking to a young widow. She's concerned about how she's going to invest all this money properly and not mess this up, or she's concerned how she's going to eat tomorrow. That's exactly. These are the right. two options. And term, take care of your dadgum family, man. Term life insurance can replace income, pay off debts, cover funeral expenses, so your family can actually have the opportunity to just be sad, yeah, to just miss you. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's saying I love you to your family, term life insurance. Jeff Zander and the team at Zander Insurance makes it easy and affordable. I've used them personally for 25 years. They're the only people I trust. Go to Xander.com or call 800-356-4282. Jade Washall, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Um, Trying to think now, it's been probably two years ago. Uh, my buddies over at the Daily Wire called me and said, hey, want to have dinner. Uh, a buddy of ours named uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is in town, uh, and, and um, you need to know this guy. And I'm like, okay, if you say I need to know him, we'll go have dinner. So we all got together, had a, had a lengthy dinner, had a, light, a great yeah. conversation. Next thing I look up, the guy's running for president. <laughs> so, uh, But you did come on the show before that, yeah. um, after that, and, and talk about your book, Woke Capitalism, right? Yeah, Woke Inc. was my first book. Woke Inc. Yep. Woke Inc., yeah, yep. that was it. And uh, because you were working on a whole... Um, movement in the hedge fund world and in the uh, mutual fund world to offset some of the woke stuff that's happening on Wall Street. Uh, But then I look up and and you're out there um, making a a very interesting run. We had some email interactions Mm -hmm. just personally back and forth while you're out there doing that stuff. That's got to be quite an adventure to be out there. Oh, yeah. Bumping heads with Nikki. I know Nikki, too. She sat here, too. And uh, with, with, of course, President Trump and everybody else and uh, all the different players that were involved. It was very interesting. It was eye-opening. And I think the thing I learned from traveling this country, Dave, is that we're taught to believe that we're divided. And that's what I thought going into this race. I'd say my most positive learning coming out of it is that if you actually talk to human beings from New York to California to the Midwest. As opposed to, to talking heads. Yeah, as opposed to as opposed to digital impressions of human beings. If you talk to actual human beings, 
80% of us in this country share the same values in common right now. And I think half the 20% that we think are on the other side are people who are younger than me who never learned those values in the first place, who I think will come along believing in free speech, meritocracy, the pursuit of excellence, the rule of law, just basic rules of the road that regardless of race or political affiliation for that matter, Democrat or Republican, even 80 plus percent of us in this country, I think still are united around certain basic principles. And I don't say that in some cheesy kind of way. It was, I think, a surprise to me. You go into this from the world of cable news and digital and social media, creating the artifact of division that I don't see actually existing in real American homes and interactions. So the question is, how do we call the bluff on that division? I tried to do some of calling a lot of bluffs on the campaign of the media and of, I think, a lot of government dishonesty that's left this country worse off. But um, you know, hopefully proud of what we began, and we're going to continue it in other ways. One of the things I've talked about from stage in our events for many years, and it always gets a cheer, regardless of political affiliation, is um, the idea that if you can get out of debt and get on a plan and increase your generosity, the things you can do, and I can show some examples of when an entire community does this, uh, how, how many St. Jude hospitals we can build mm -hmm. with uh, how many uh, foster children get a home. Uh, yeah. When we the people start taking care of we the people, it becomes very inspiring. And the beautiful part about it is the byproduct of that is it puts the government out of business. It does. <laughs> and, and, and the beauty of this country is we're the best country known to man to at least give people that opportunity. I mean, every one of us has our own unique God-given gift, right? And I think that this is a country, we use a word like merit. I use that word a lot, but what does it mean? I think it's living as part of a system where everybody can achieve the maximum of their God-given potential without any government or any system standing in your way. And that's what got us this far 250 years into this country. It's what allowed me to live the American dream that I have. And, a system, and I want to pass it on. A system can be a negative system. Oh, it absolutely Racism, can. sexism, those are systems. Mm -hmm. And so without any system, not just a bureaucratic mm -hmm. system, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's the beauty of this country. And, you know, I'm an entrepreneur by background. Politics was new to me. I learned a lot about politics. Not all of it was positive. <laughs> but, <laughs> I bet. Uh, most of it, I would say, was uh, left me, I would say, a little more cynical, but a little bit more informed on the other side of it. I'm an entrepreneur by background. I start companies. And so that's part of what I've gone back to in the meantime is the world of entrepreneurship and driving change through the private sector in changing this country for the better and meeting the needs of, I think, for example, you talked about woke capitalism. One of the companies I had started before I ran for president was a company called Strive that competes directly against BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard by standing for actual corporate purpose. Companies should do what allows them to be most valuable, not pushing somebody else's social agenda. That's part of how we drive change in this country too, is it's not just gonna be done through the government, but through our educational system, through the private sector as well. I think people can drive a lot of positive change too, and I'm trying to do that in the meantime. Vivek Ramaswamy is with us. Jade Washar is my co-host. Jade? Yeah, I want to know. So one of your 10 truths that you talk about is the idea that capitalism can lift people out of poverty. Yes. A lot of people would push back hard against that. They feel like capitalism is one of the things that's keeping them trapped. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. And I want to distinguish between crony capitalism, which is a perversion of the real thing, and sure. actual true capitalism. That's Cody a good Capital distinction. And it's important, right? Because many people who are earnestly frustrated with what they see as an oppressive system of capitalism isn't really the real thing. Mm. It's this version where companies through lobbying and other forms of non-competitive non measures are using the force of government to create barriers that stop them from mm -hmm. achieving their dreams. You see this in the pharmaceutical sector. I mean, a lot of the lobbying results in less competition, which contributes to high prescription drug pricing. That's right. So when people say, I can't afford to buy my medicines, well, part of what they're having frustration with isn't capitalism, but the capture of a healthcare system that isn't working as efficiently as it should. You see in the health insurance marketplace, a lot of health insurers are not really, not a lot of health insurance brokers aren't really serving up the right plans for their actual clients to select. Mm -hmm. But that's the product of crony capitalism, which is a perversion of the real system. And so I think my first distinction is, I might share your same frustration. I probably do. Mm -hmm. Companies should not use the government as a lobbying instrument to block competition. Now, on the flip side, look at actual free market capitalism. The only way you're able to get ahead as an entrepreneur or as a business 
is if you're providing something of value, of greater value to the person who's paying for it than it takes for it costing you to provide it. Mm. And that's fundamentally an other regarding activity. So if you're actually providing something of inherent value to somebody else, that is what's lifted people up from poverty. It's why U.S. stock market returns have outpaced European stock market returns for decades because their model of capitalism is to have capitalists try to take care of social issues. Whereas the U.S. model of capitalism is one that says when companies are creating products and services that serve people and stay true to that mission, that actually creates wealth for everybody. Mm. Yeah. Real capitalism is where profit is the applause your customers give you. Exactly. For having served them well. It's Beautiful. that simple. It's that simple. And so, you know, money or the making of money when it's done in service of human beings. I haven't heard that line. I'm going to take that, though. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. It, 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 it just it it. When you're when it when it's an act of service, one of yes. our core values is here. If we help enough people, yeah. right, Ramsey, we don't have to worry about money. That's, That's one exactly of our core right. values. We have fourteen core values on the wall. That's one of them on the wall all through the building here. And so our job is to make sure that we are a blessing, mm -hmm. and then we can't keep the blessings from flowing at us. It's actually interesting you mentioned that. It's even one of the pieces of advice I give to young people. So you're talking about the customer side. Even if you talk about the labor market or the job side of it, mm -hmm. a young person can't find a job. Here's my advice to him is show up somewhere and volunteer to work there. Make yourself so valuable and indispensable such that when it comes time for you to find another opportunity to move on, <laughs> they won't let you leave. Yeah. They're going to actually pay you what you actually deserve. And so it goes whether you're an employee looking for a job, a business selling a product. Yeah. I love that. Is bathe. Actually do the right thing. Bathe. Smile. Mm. Have some energy. Bring it, yeah. add value, and you can't. They they won't. They, they'll do anything to. They're keep not going to let you go. They're and not so, going to let you go. And that is cap. To me, that's so true unusual. capitalism. Is actually you provide something of value to somebody else, either as a worker or as a company or whatever it is, without the cronyism in government, the corruption that you mm -hmm. see of lobbying the government to be able to mess with that competition, that's true capitalism that lifts us up. There's such a distinction there that you speak about, and I, I agree with you. Why, how, why do you think it gets grouped together when, we're, when we can see it so distinctly different? Yeah, well, I'll be candid on this. I think that the Republican Party has assumed the mantle of standing for capitalism, but much of the Republican Party has been corrupted by some of the same forces of crony capitalism, subsidies or favoritism or corporate welfare, such that somebody else earnestly saying, okay, you guys stand for capitalism, but you got the bailouts in 2008. That happened under a Republican administration. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a Republican president, Republican treasury secretary, bailed out institutions that took on way more debt than they needed to, way I got, more leverage. I got to, I, you're not hearing That's the bump music. I got to go, brother. <laughs> Vivek Ramswamy, check him out, at Vivek G. Ramaswamy, at Instagram and at X. Be sure and check him out. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Hey guys, it's Rachel Cruz here to tell you about a faith-based alternative to health insurance that can make healthcare more affordable, Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM allows members to share each other's healthcare costs and it's as easy as one, two, three. Step one, choose the healthcare provider you want. Step two, submit your eligible bills. And step three, get reimbursed. CHM members take care of your eligible medical bills. With no networks and the freedom to choose your healthcare provider, CHM is the best option for Christians who want to take care of their families and help other believers. Find out more at chministries.org slash budget. Jade Washaw, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. Patrick is with us in Little Rock. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Jade. Um, I am really honored to call you guys today. This has been a long-time thing that I've wanted to do is call in and ask for some advice. Of course, there's many times I needed to do that earlier, probably, but uh, I'm kind of in a little bit of a situation. Um our 
just recently, uh, let me back up a little bit. My daughter, two years ago, she was born with a very rare genetic disorder uh, called trisomy 13. She uh, was very medically challenged for a long time. We were not able to work. Uh, I was not able to work like I needed to, and my wife was a stay-at-home mom, obviously. Uh, she was very to the point where it was really bad because she had to constantly be suctioned and things like that, and in and out of the hospital pretty much, I would say, 80% of the time. Wow. Um, and then, you know, they told her, they told us that, you know, we had two to four days maybe with her at most wow. and that was two something years ago uh oh. and and she she lived a long two plus years uh up until recently and mm. and she passed just january oh uh, i'm sorry god, thank you uh god, god though is so good and his grace is so good um two days before she passed we found out we were expecting another baby. Wow. And so God God really uh, knew what he was doing because if that, you know, it's just the timing of everything that, that, that just gives glory to God, I think. But uh, anyways, so we are in a situation right now, um, and I emotionally we are obviously not where we should be. We are having a lot of issues and stuff, and, and work is it's something we have to still do and still continue to go on. Uh, before she passed though, I had started, I've been a paint contractor for probably about 13 years. And, uh, I've been wanting to get out of that for, for about three years of that time and do something different. I started on the side, a, uh, business doing like, um, excavation and stuff like that. And that is taking off, uh, starting to take off. It's a little slow at first, but I I don't I didn't go out and get a bunch of debt. Um, and then how, how much did you make in March? So in March we made about two thousand dollars, which it's a, just a side thing right now. So it's not. Well, if it's uh, just a side thing, what's your main gig? My main gig is still painting, and I also do uh, like like construction work and stuff on. Uh, okay, so how I much did you make? To- how much you make total in March? Uh. My income, not including my wife's, was probably about thirty five hundred. What, what does your wife yeah, about make? About thirty five. She makes twenty five hundred uh, okay. a month. All right. And what's your question, Patrick? So my question is, she is pregnant, obviously, um, and we are. I'm wanting to know if I should just go out and get a full time job and not worry about what I'm doing part time. Uh, both of my businesses are basically part-time. I guess I sh- should say it like that. Can you I get enough business? Enough. Do you have the emotional energy with all you've been through to get enough business to stay busy and make a living? I believe I do. I, I I'm honestly, um, so you can go because, from 3,500 to 4,500 and by the end of the year be at 5,500 a month average. I hope that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you, and, can, and if you my, believe my you could do that, why would you? Big. If you think you can do that, why would you go get a job? That that's exactly. But I mean, I've been battling this because I don't know. Like, I want someone to just tell me, "Hey, that's stupid. You should. You got a baby coming." Because my wife is going to be quitting when. when well, to, to uh, be if, fair, if you can make more and more and more money, that's good. If a baby's coming. I know. I, 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 well, and I was. Uh, that's that's exactly what I'm thinking too. But I have heard that it's not good sometimes to um, run with a, a, a side venture and not knowing what it's going to do. Honestly, I want to do that full time. Well, you're combining yeah, the side one mind. with your main one. Your main gig was the painting. You were making you know, X off of that, and then you added the excavation to it. And to be fair, t- in your own words, you haven't really had the time or resource or energy or emotional energy to put 100% into this. And so now you're you're going to start being able to do that. And I think with all the of, numbers, all of these are construction. Yeah, you're in the construction business. Yes. You do excavation, you do painting, and, and you do some other construction work, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, just and, go do a whole bunch wild, of it, man. One wild card I did not mention. I didn't have enough time to because my mind wasn't to the screener. But uh, one thing that is the wild card in our case is we're actually our house 
where we live at. We are actually living in a camper right now. Uh, not not uh, permanently, okay. just temporarily until we get our house built. We are building a house right oh, now. Oh, Jesus. And wow. Yes, yes. And I know what you say about building a house. and it, 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 I We did it wrong. But we're we're almost to the end of it, and we're gonna we're gonna be happy with the result. But we're if I could have in retrospect gone. That doesn't change the answer about your business. No. I mean, if you're if you're making thirty five hundred towards forty five hundred towards fifty five hundred in your construction business, that's going to assist in the new baby coming. That's going to assist in finishing the house. Mm-hmm. That's going to assist in you running your running your life. If you go take a job making three thousand dollars a month period, and you got a J-O-B, you're not going to make as much as if you go run this business well. But the honest question you have to do is you have to quit getting distracted by 63,000 things. If you're over there working on a stupid house instead of earning money to feed your family, see, that's a distraction. And so that house may may slow way down while you speed this business up. Because, Patrick, if, if you've got the emotional energy with the tragedy you all have been through to go get after it on this business you need to completely focus on making stacking cash making a big old pile of money and if y'all need to go rent an apartment and get out of the trailer because you got a pregnant wife that's not a bad thing and then take an extra year to finish this stupid house i'm fine the house is the least of my worries you grow in this career take care of your family is the number one job and if you don't have the emotional bandwidth to do that and get out of that trailer with a pregnant wife camping trailer by the way, uh, then then you do need to go take a job. Mm-hmm. So, but but the job is going to be less money than you could make if you can pull it together That's for the right. business. I think so too. I think he just needs to add a couple more services on there and just get after it. Yeah. Do whatever work you can do. Just within take ev- take everything and go mm-hmm. and make a profit on all of it and go and make a profit and go mm-hmm. and go and go. And you can clean up and decide what, I don't want to do that kind of thing anymore later. But right now you're doing it. Yeah. Swinging a hammer, swinging a brush, uh, you know, digging a hole, whatever mm-hmm. it is you're doing, get it done and do a bunch of it all the time and charge a lot. And <laughs> smile and smile and go make you some money. There is nothing wrong with that. All you're doing is taking care of people's problems. Um, but, you know, job one is baby and wife. Uh, job two is to grow your business to take care of them. Dealing with this stupid butt construction house is way down the list of things you got to be worrying about right now. So uh, if, if that thing sits nothing for a little while, I'm okay with that. Uh, but you don't, you know. You don't need to be over there working at night when you could be working at night making money mm-hmm. for your family. So right now you don't have the time, you don't have the bandwidth to be swinging a hammer on that job. You got to swing a hammer on somebody else's job. It's giving you money. So that's what we're going to focus on is making money. And you, the good news is you're in a business that you just as soon as you start putting the word out and you mm-hmm. just tell people and you just go get another one, then go get another one, then go get another one. You're going to make a lot of money. That's right. Oh, yeah. People always need something done. Yeah. People always need (laughs) some handiwork done, whether it's put me some bathroom tiles in, change out my bathtub. There's always something that's going on. Always. Always. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey guys, Ramsey Solutions started small and grew fast. Because of that rapid growth, there were times when our systems slowed us down. That's why we switched to NetSuite. It works for us and it'll help your business too. Whether you're starting on a card table like I did or you're well on your way to becoming a multi-million dollar company, NetSuite can scale with you and help you communicate and plan better. Because you know your day-to-day up and down and sideways, but accounting, analytics, and supply chain are on another level. 
So maybe you're just not tech savvy. That can be okay. NetSuite will help at your speed and whatever your situation. More than 37,000 companies use NetSuite to know their numbers and their business better. So check out NetSuite today and find out how they can help you become the business you want to be five or 30 years from now. And right now, you can download NetSuite's free KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. Jade Washall, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. You do not have to lose sleep worrying about your money anymore. We want you to come to the Ramsey campus for the Total Money Makeover weekend on May 10th and 11th, and we're going to show you how to get control of your life. How would it feel to know that you're going to be out of debt so that you could become wealthy, so that you could become outrageously generous? How would that feel? What would that do for your relationships, for your hope? It's what we do. And we're going to do that Friday afternoon, all day Saturday, May 10th and 11th, the total money makeover weekend. Not only how to get out of debt, but how to become an investor and how to be generous, how to work with your spouse. Ken Coleman's going to be speaking on increasing your income. Dr. John Deloney on increasing your peace. Jade Washaw will be speaking. George Camel, Rachel Cruz, and me. And so all of us, all the Ramsey personalities are going to be here. We're going to have lots of Q&As. It's going to be very experiential. And you're going to laugh, you're going to cry, and you're going to come away knowing you can do this. Bring your spouse that's reluctant. They will leave crazier than you are. Bring your friend who thinks you're crazy, and they will leave really crazy doing this stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun, Jade. I'm excited about this. I'm excited, too. I can't wait. Our Platinum Plus tickets are already sold out. You can still get a Platinum ticket, a VIP ticket, or a general admissions ticket at RamseySolutions.com slash events. Suggest you get them now. May 10th and 11th is coming up really, really fast. It's here on the campus at the Ramsey Event Center. I'm excited to get to do a Total Money Makeover event right here in our own backyard and excited that a bunch of you are coming from all over the place to be here. You do not want to miss this event. It is life changing. Mm -hmm. Grayson is with us in Nebraska. Hi, Grayson. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can I help? Hi. So my husband and I have been looking at our financial goals, and it's just looking like it's going to take a long time to get over some humps. And so I, my question is basically, do I need to be patient or should we make changes? Well, tell us the timeline so we can chime in. So I don't know the timeline exactly, but right now we have about... 8500 in our savings account, uh, which is a little bit over our three-month savings. Okay. And um, we're wanting to save for a house. Um, we're renting right now. And okay. I'm a stay-at-home mom. My husband makes um, 575 Right now, it's going to go up to 65 soon. Okay. And so you're trying to save for a down payment for a house. That's the goal. Right. And we are not investing yet. How and old so are we you? also want to start doing that. I'm 23. He's also 23. Okay. So uh, what percentage down are you trying to get to? What's I mean, the we goal number? Do it the 20, 20% okay. for a 15 year fix. Yeah, that's the ideal. Okay. And so what does that mean for you on the, how much the size money, how house much you're money trying do you to get? Need? How much money do you need? Um. I guess I don't know for sure how much money we need because of like house prices fluctuating. We don't know exactly what kind of house we're going to want, but and so how how is it around. that you know if you're off track or impatient? I mean, you don't you don't have your if you have a target and a date, 
and you don't think you're going to hit that target in date, then you can ask you, you know, there's a hump, there's a problem. But right now you're just, you, right now you've just got a general idea. We'd like to get a house someday. Oh, okay. Well, I'd like to get into a house quickly, <laughs> but it seems like it's going to What is be, quickly? I guess in the next, like, three years. Okay. And so how much can you save a year? Uh... A year, I don't know, but I know monthly we save about seven hundred. Okay, that's eighty four hundred a year. In three years, you'll have twenty four thousand. Okay. You just need to do a little bit. Of, you, you need to dig down and do some research on this and really get your head around the numbers. And then, okay, to Dave's point, you'll have twenty four thousand. Go over and do the how much home can I afford calculator on RamseySolutions.com. And then you're going to be able to plug in the numbers, look at real estate in your area, look at what 20% of a down payment would be and put it, put real weight to these numbers and see what's actually possible. And then you can look at that and go, okay, if 24,000 doesn't get it, what do I need to save? And yeah, then you can actually you can have say, a okay, real target. Yeah. What have I got to pick up as a side job while I'm working and while I'm at home with the babies and what can he do to pick up his income also above 65 mm -hmm. so we can do more than 8,400. Mm -hmm. And because if he made an extra ten thousand dollars a year on the side, uh, then for three years, that's another thirty thousand. Instead of twenty thousand down, we're now talking about fifty thousand down. That changes the game. Mm -hmm. So that's that's yeah, how you start backing into this and figuring out if you're impatient or not. Mm -hmm. If you told me you wanted fifty thousand by the end of this year to buy a house, you make sixty five thousand dollars a year, and you don't have any money, then I would say, yeah, you're impatient, and unrealistic. There's not any math in your story that's going to take you there, right? But that's not what you're mm -hmm. saying. And so you're, mm -hmm. three years, if you're 23, you're going to be you're going to be 26. That's not a bad timeline. I kind of like that timeline. If it takes one more year, so what? Not the end of the world. We've at least are aiming at something. We've got a game plan, and we're talking this through. Yeah. But but all all good financial goals have a longer time horizon, meaning. Bad financial goals are lead you to doing nothing but partying. Thank God it's Friday. Oh, God, it's Monday. Long-term financial goals are thinking the way you're thinking. Okay, where am I going to be when I'm 26? Where am I going to be when I'm 23? Now, am I, what have I got to do to get to those things that we're not doing now? What must be true that's not true yeah. now mm -hmm. to hit that desired future, as Henry Cloud says? And uh, then... You know, then you're going to be there. But I, I don't hear anything that's completely in dreamland or la-la land here. I think this is all doable. You'd probably just got to think through, you know, what other – if we want to do this in two years or three years and we want – Price X. If we want a two hundred and fifty thousand dollars house, then no, you're not going to be ready at well, twenty four thousand. You know, I think to your point, Dave, you're right. There usually is an extended timeline, and I think people kind of get weirded out, thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to be disciplined for this amount of time." You're going to be like, disciplined the rest of your life. Yeah, it's easy to be disciplined and for, you, and you don't have to. It's just if you want the house, that's what you have yeah, to do. That's right. It's, you don't. You know, if you don't get the if you don't want the house, then you don't have to be disciplined. That's right, but it's not going to be. Poof. Yeah. There, there, this is how you get things, is you make the money behave. Mm -hmm. And so that that's what you're facing, Grace. And I think you're in better shape maybe than your emotions feel like you are. Um, but I think it'll help the emotions if you lay down a detailed plan of exactly, A, where we want to go, and B, how are we going to get there? And uh, what are the steps to get there? And, and then what have we got to do different that we're not doing now to accelerate that plan? And you can start to have those discussions around that that makes a lot of sense so good question by the way so here's an interesting thing there's a lot of um squawking and carrying on that gen z can't buy a house mm -hmm. it's impossible well it is if you make fifty seven thousand dollars a year and you live in san francisco 100 percent. and you're 23 you're not gonna buy a house there yeah, that that is impossible. Yeah, that's so you can't. But so so. But does that mean you can't buy a house? No, you can live in Omaha, Nebraska, and you know what? Two hundred thousand dollars to buy in Omaha, a nice house, mm -hmm. a nice house, with okay. some cornfields in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. There's some cornfields in the back. But yeah, the old corn huskers, right? So, mm -hmm. but I mean, it, it's, uh, and probably some pheasants. But yeah, the, uh, uh, so, but the point is, is that you've got to say, okay, my income and my dreams and my location, all three have to be aligned. That's right. And so, 
when I started the show 30 years ago, the idea of living in Manhattan, downtown New York City, if you made $60,000 a year, and $60,000 a year 30 years ago is a lot of money. It was. It was impossible. You couldn't do it. You're kidding. You can't live in 60... You can't. Couldn't do it. And you can't do it now either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it has to do with lining up your dreams with your realities instead of just wishing things were different. And Grayson's doing just that. That's why she's going to win. This is The Ramsey Show. Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Jade Washaw, number one best-selling author of the Ramsey Quick Read, and uh, of course Ramsey Personality. She's my co-host today. The phone number is 888-825-5225. James is in Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, James. How are you? I'm all right, and yourself? Better than I deserve. What's up? Hi. So, a little bit of backstory. I'm a couple years out of college, and I've been working at a large public accounting firm since then. And I guess I am kind of at a point uh, in my time doing that where I've decided that I might be looking to do something else because I don't get a lot of fulfillment out of it. Um, and I guess I just have a hard time deciding, you know, how do I do I decide when to do that, and also, I guess, what career path to pursue, uh, you know, because, I mean, I, I have an attraction to, like, you know, a management uh, area. Um, I have a, um, a minor in business management, you know, along with my degree, and also for context, I've passed the CPA exam, so I have that for what it's worth, but um, it's just, I don't know where to go from there. And Okay, so you, you went to an extreme amount of trouble. To become an accountant. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you've discovered that the version of accounting that you do in a public accounting firm is not fun for you. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. So what is it? Because it occurs to me that possibly it is not that you hate accounting. It's that you hate accounting there. I suppose. Um, I guess I was kind of afraid to try and move into another role just because. What, I guess kind, I don't what kind of other board. role? So some other roles I've looked at are, I guess we call them, you know, in the industry, we call them industry positions. So you don't work in public, you work for a company. Like I've looked at this hospital position that has, you know, accounting positions within various levels um, mm-hmm. and a few other places. And, they just haven't panned out like, you know, I've applied, and I know that that's not the best way to get into a position like that, but it just it hasn't panned out for me thus far. So, I so kind of thinking, okay. that doesn't mean it's not what you want to do. Just hadn't found the job is all. Yeah. I don't think you know exactly what you want to do. I think... I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, what I'm suggesting is there's a possibility you are not disillusioned with the accounting field. You are disillusioned with being an accountant in a public accounting firm, which is pretty much a grind. Mm, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, what, two years out of school, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're, just, they're dumping everything. In, there's a brother on your desk. You're, you're just in a, you know, you're just a widget machine right now, right? about right <laughs> yeah well no wonder it's not fun but that doesn't mean accounting isn't fun for you i suppose i guess you I sure have kinda... done a lot of it for somebody who hates it 
<laughs> well, I mean, what would your like, ideal if you if you had your ideal s- scenario as an accountant, what would it be? And then work backwards from that. My ideal scenario, and I'll tell you what it is here in a second, isn't something that I think exists in public accounting anymore, just because it's changed as an industry. And that's it's fine. More of an industry. Okay. It'd be more like an industry position, but so it's uh, I guess more like the nuts and bolts of accounting, like you know, um, explaining. I guess, transactions yeah. and, you know, how they affect financial statements to yeah. people as they need it. Because like the accounting in, in people do at Ramsey all day long. Yeah, they sit, yeah, they sit yeah. with the uh, business units and they talk about how to do the business and tell them what the accounting is telling. You know, here, here's the tea leaves. The tea leaves in the, the accounting reports are telling you in the business unit this, this, and this. And what other, mm-hmm. what other KPIs, what other things can we do to assist you to make your business run better? It's, it, you know, it's, an, it's a live, breathing thing when you do accounting in a place like ours. It, exactly. And it's just I don't feel like that's exists in the public scenario. Yeah, and so I guess don't I do it anymore. So go get one of those. Okay. But it doesn't mean you have to go become a, a, a guitar player. Yeah. Or you have to get a degree in art. <laughs> yeah. You know, which would be like the other side of the spectrum from your brain. Yeah. Well, and so, the I mean... Other side of the, spect- the other side, I guess, and this would be like a whole heck of a pivot, so to speak, but it would be... You know, if I'm just that fed up with it, moving into, I guess, again, management or even crazier, a trade. But, like, I guess it doesn't sound like. See, accounting is. Um, here, here's an interesting number for you, okay? Of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, over 60% of them have an accounting degree. Mm-hmm. And most of them from public universities, by the way. Mm -hmm. not from muckety-muck universities. So the accounting degree is very functional because in order to get an accounting degree, you have to learn business. Otherwise, accounting doesn't even make sense. And so you're qualified to walk in to business settings and create... I mean, you're probably inexperienced in business, and so you've got some, probably got to get some calluses, but you have the ability to go create some serious business acumen over the next decade and maybe be a CFO somewhere. Mm. That kind of thing. And so that's that's what I'm saying. It, and that's really not that big a pivot. It's using your mm-hmm. education and your natural bent and your skill set just to apply it in a different place that has more life to it than the widget machine you're stuck in. Yeah. So I don't I don't blame you. I mean, what what I, I think what you're doing would make me want to. I mean, I I, I couldn't stand it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I, but I couldn't stand just generally doing accounting all day anyway because I'm not detail yeah. enough. But because I'm not that. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to send you Ken Coleman's Get Clear Career Assessment and his new book, Find the Work You're Wired to Do. Okay, and the book explains Thank how the, it explains how the career assessment works. But I think the career assessment, just from talking to you, I might be wrong. It's a very, very good tool, by the way. We've sold almost 100,000 of them, and we've now put them in this book. So, folks, when you buy the book, find the work you're wired to do. It comes with the career assessment, a code to take the career assessment on our website, and it's it really gives you insight. So I think it's going to help you a ton, James. And and I think it's going, my opinion is, and I, you could call me back and tell me I'm crazy later. It, it may tell you something else. It may tell you to be an artist. But I think it's going to tell you you're doing the right thing in the wrong place. All right. Well, I, I hope that it gives me some direction. I really appreciate that information those thoughts sure i'll send that to you you hang on and the team will pick up and we will get you signed up just for that so um but i i i get the sense that james is not doesn't suddenly hate numbers i don't think so there's many applications that you can do the same skill set yeah i'm a version of that yeah (laughs) that's true that's true yeah we never would have thought the uh, the lady on the cruise ship stage is going to end up a Ramsey personality, but both of them have microphones. The same, there we go. It's the same skill set. This is the Ramsey Show.
Jade Washaw, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here. Hey, Rachel Cruz's second kid's book, I'm Glad for Where I Am, is available today. It is book launch day. That's right. Rachel has an exceptional gift of storytelling uh, that both parents and kids enjoy. These illustrations bring the adventure to life. It's a perfect gift for kids. I'm glad for what I have. The first book was about contentment versus entitlement. I'm glad for where I am teaches you about gratitude, particularly about home. And I'm glad for what I have, and I'm glad for where I am, or both in our store. You can order your copy at RamseySolutions.com slash store. And Rachel's going to be out and about. Tomorrow she'll be in Phoenix signing books, and on April the 17th in Los Angeles. Uh, the next day, April the 18th, and uh, Dallas, April the 20th. The following week in Atlanta on April the 27th. So do a little story time, read the books, read the book, and uh, bring the kiddos out and get the book signed. Uh, these books are the first one to hit the uh, children's number one bestseller list. Number one on the best of children's bestseller list. I'm trying to get that right out of my mouth. And um, this one will too. They are they're fabulous. I've already been reading them to the grandkids. Of course, I've got an inside track on this, and so the grandbabies love it. The Ramsey grandbabies endorse Rachel's book. I'm just saying. <laughs> so uh, good stuff. And uh, the book is I'm glad for where I am. And uh, if you can teach kiddos gratitude, you can teach them contentment in a world gone crazy. Grateful people, content people are peaceful, highly attractive people. Mm. And that's what you want your kids to grow up to be. Yeah. This is The Ramsey Show. Jade Washaw is my co-host. Aaron is in Des Moines. Hi, Aaron. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, thanks for having me. Sure. What's up? I am. Well, so I just have a couple of questions for you. I'm around seven hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars in debt, and I have an idea of how to tackle it, but my wife is on board with with my idea. So I just wanted to get your advice on how to tackle this and what you would do in my situation. Is that including a house? It is. So it's a primary that I owe four fifty on, uh, and it's, I have a secondary house that um, we we move. It was our primary, so we're still within that window of capital gains if we were to sell. But I owe one hundred and ninety two on that one. What's so it worth? About, it's worth about three twenty five. Okay, and what's the four fifty? Uh, the house you owe four fifty. What's it worth? Uh, around four ninety. We just bought it less than a year okay. ago, so yeah. All right. All right. And so you've got two hundred uh, six fifty, um, which leaves one thirty five in other debt. What is that? Yeah, so two of them are vehicles. About forty thousand of it is our vehicles. Uh-huh. Uh, one for me and one for my wife. Uh-huh. About fifteen thousand is personal debt. Uh, six of it's a credit card, and nine of it is a personal loan, uh-huh. and twenty nine thousand on a student loan. Yeah, you guys are seriously broke. What do y'all um, make? Yeah, <laughs> we are. Um, combined, uh, so my wife is a stay-at-home mom, but I make my base salary, my W-2, is 175000 and I have about 20000 in gross rental income from that, so that first property. Okay. So you make about two hundred a year? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And why can't y'all live on that? Well, I think it's lifestyle creep because it's uh, you know less than a it's been less than a year ago my salary doubled and mm-hmm. I think we just kind of went crazy. So what is it? That. What is it you're wanting to do that your wife is not in tune with? So I'm wanting to sell that that uh, rental property before the capital gains becomes a uh, an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Y- use that to clear out all of our consumer debt and. And then just start tackling our primary mortgage with you know, the snowball. It's, 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 it's what, what, why doesn't she want to do that? Well, uh, it, it's next to some relatives. Our, our primary home's next to some relatives. And we're kind of using who are the some relatives? Work. Her parents? <laughs> no, they're uh, my my brother and his wife, and they're pretty close. Her, her his wife and, and her are pretty close, so. So that means you have to own a rental property next door? (laughs) That's kind of where I'm at with this whole thing. Well, what does she say? Is is that the reason? It's a safety net, really, because we just picked up... How is it a safety net? You guys are freaking broke. Yeah, that's really what I'm I'm trying to get across to her is just, you know, 
has she yeah. seen the numbers? Have you laid out the way you just laid it out with us? Have you, have you sat and said, look, honey, here's where we're at. Have you guys done that? You know, we, we have, um, her and I both come from traditional backgrounds of living on consumer debt with our, our families. And her idea of never being in debt is just that it's not possible to do. And, you know, after you know, finding. Well, it's pretty Ramsey, possible if you sell the rental house. That's, that's, that's I mean, that's kind of why is I'm it not at. possible? Of course it's possible. It's yeah. just you don't want to do well, it. Think, yeah, one, one of the, the crutches is that 2.5% interest rate that we have on that thing. And it's just. But yeah, which is such a blessing. <laughs> Because <laughs> y'all are freaking starving to death, making two hundred thousand bucks and spending like you're in Congress. We I mean, t- I yeah. think I think you have a, a pretty serious uh, level of denial going on inside your household here. That I'm a lot more upset about than you are. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We you know we grew together. We, we went from having nothing to having to where we're at today. nothing to yeah, having a negative net worth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, you're exactly right. And you're making more money than you ever made in your life, and you're more broke than you've ever been in your life mm-hmm. because you want to own a oh. rental property next door to your brother in law. Uh, no thanks. We so, talked about this earlier about the idea that real estate's not always a good thing. It's not a good thing. And this is not, well, no, what's going on here is there is zero control on spending in this mm-hmm. house. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what's really going on. That's the core of this is that, okay, now we're going to admit we bought cars we can't afford. We've been taking vacations we couldn't afford, and we've been buying crap on Amazon that we can't afford. And so we got credit card debt and personal loans coming out our ears and two car payments, and we make $200,000 a year. So, I, I, Aaron, I, I don't think this is a financial problem. I think this is a denial problem, and I think the two of you need to sit down and you need – Probably, if I'm in your situation, I'm going to go, honey, look, I, I can't live like this. This is ridiculous. I'm working my butt off, and we're going backward because you won't sit down and look and deal with our spending, our overspending. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm willing to work on it. I'm willing to do the sacrificing to win. I am not willing to live like this. Just because your parents live broke and your brother-in-law lives broke and everybody else lives broke, paycheck to paycheck, making $200,000 a year, I don't want to live like that. I'm not going to live like that. So we're getting ready to do something different around here. And, you know, that's how it's going to sound at our house. And so – uh, and if we can't come to, uh, you know, some kind of agreement where we start acting like adults and living on less than we make and making adult decisions about our future, then we've got real serious marriage issues and we need to sit down with a marriage counselor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just I'm detecting that the at least the wife sounds like she's got these status symbols in place. Oh, we make two hundred thousand dollars. We need to be able to show everybody that we're making this money. And it's with the cars and the, the being able to buy what you want on the credit cards and having the second rental property. And how will, how will it look to other other people if we start to downsize and we start to cut back in areas and it shows and i think people are very afraid of you know, those changes showing you really got to watch out calling this show when jade's here because she'll just read your mail you just nailed that that's exactly what's going on it's it, yeah she exactly really cares about what and, people and think. here's the thing you're gonna be broke your whole life you're gonna work your whole life and be broke when you do that, not not just Aaron, but anybody who's yeah. following this plan, uh, because if you one of the benefits of going broke is when I went broke is I lost my need to make you people happy. If you, you know what I drove today, a really nice car, you know why I drove it? It's because what I want to drive. I don't care if any of you know I've got it or see it. I enjoy driving the freaking car. It's none of your dad gum business. I used to when I was an immature little twit drove a car because I wanted to see people to see me driving that car. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of difference. And one will make you broke and one will make you rich. Not caring what people think is a superpower. Whew, man, it's right next to common sense. It's like the whole council of superpowers right there. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show.
Jade Washaw, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thanks for being with us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Carmen is in Clarksville. Hi, Carmen. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? We just have a quick question. Uh, We are going to be selling a rental property that we own in a different state than where we currently reside, and we're going to be getting a pretty decent size net profit off of that. Cool. How much are you going to make? uh, We think between like 200 and 250 um, based off current estimations. Yeah, we're pretty excited about that. Um, And we were just curious what the Ramsey principal thing to do with it would be. Well, what baby step are you on? Um, so I'm terrible about keeping track. I think it's like five, six, and seven. So we okay. have, or I'm sorry, four, five, and six. Okay. Um, we have no debt except the house that we'll be selling has a mortgage still. Our primary home we're living in currently has a mortgage, but no debt outside of that. What's, okay. the, what's the balance on your mortgage? That we currently live in, our primary home? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, about 320, 325. Mm-hmm. Okay. But a little, I like throw a wrench in things. This home will not be a long-term play for us. My husband is active duty military, um, okay. and we will be leaving this house in probably like one to three years, which kind of made me more cautious of putting that money toward this property mm-hmm. um, and wondering if there might be a better play with it since it's more short-term. Mm-hmm. What's your interest rate? Uh, it's pretty high, five, six, seven, five. We've only been here just about two years, yeah. so we bought... Peak price, peak interest rate. Okay, so what is the risk of making 5% on your money by putting it on your mortgage? I guess nothing. (laughs) Yes, there is no risk there. Because, Um, I mean, when you sell the house, you're going to get the money back, right? Yeah. When we leave here, we'll be looking at, like, moving back to where our families are from. Yeah, and you would sell the house. We didn't know if, yes. And so you, and the house, the house is worth, the house is worth about what now? Probably what we paid if we're lucky. Probably still three thirty-five, three forty-five. Yeah. Okay, and so when you sell it, if it's worth four hundred in two years, or or four fifty, you're going to get four fifty minus selling expenses if it's paid off Correct. by then. Yes. And you take that half million and go start your next life after military. Okay. Thanks so for your service, you're still by the way. This house? Oh, I, think I, I think I would, yeah. Now, is there any, I mean, are either of you driving a junk car? Is there a kid getting ready to go to college? Is there uh, nope. a little bit of light renovation? Is there something we need to do while we're in baby steps four, five, six that with some of this money and not put it all on the house? The emergency fund's good, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Everybody's car we have taken good? A short- uh, yeah, I mean, we both drive older, paid-for cars, but that are well cared for and well maintained. Um, so we don't. So you don't I think mean, in the next 12, 14 months you're going to be buying a car? Oh no. Mm-mm. Okay. All right. And um, and our kids are young, um, five and eight. So our mm-hmm. kids are little. So and we're you're not aside a little bit each month for college. We are not much because they will each be getting half of my husband's GI Bill. He's yeah. not using okay. it for himself. He's using military tuition assistance. So oh. half of their college will be paid for already. On the next um, move, I, I, said in the, I said post-military. On the next move, will he be retiring or will it just be another move? Uh, no, it will hopefully be retiring. It'll either be standard retirement or medical retirement, depending on the timeline. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Because he's, he's approaching his 20-year then. Correct. Yeah. Okay. He's at like 16 and a half now. So okay. yeah. yeah, you'd like to ride that out and get that 20 year coin for sure. That's the goal we are right. we are hoping. Yeah, that's cool. Well, thank you. Again. Thank you again for your service up. and, and for your oh, no nonsense, no nonsense assessment of this. So mm-hmm. I'm probably going to set a little bit of this aside, not a ton for just enjoyment. Okay. Like y'all take a trip or you buy yourself something that y'all have been wanting um, a little bit of a splurge, not a fifty thousand dollars splurge, but a <laughs> but a sure. but a five or a ten, okay. And, and then I'm going to throw the rest of it at the mortgage if it's me. And then I'm going to start going, okay. hey, that mortgage is now in reach. Mm-hmm. Let's start thinking about in our budget finishing that puppy off. Yeah, I think that's going to okay. serve as a big motivator because it, now you can kind of see the end of the finish line, and it's easier to run when you see the end. Car- uh, Carrie's with us in Eugene, Oregon. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure, what's up? Well, I am about to change jobs temporarily. 
Um, and I'm trying to decide, do I move my 180K from my current 401K to my new employer? Never. Or roll it into an IRA? Never. Always roll it to an IRA. Okay. Because okay. you've got 8,000 okay. mutual funds to choose from, literally. Exactly, and yeah. And your current okay. 401K That's... at your new job is going to have 12 or 14. Exactly. So part two of that question is, 401k at the new job, knowing that I'm only going to be there two to three years while I finish my master's program, do I do the employer match? Yes. Or 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 do I bump it up to max contributions? Well, I, I max it if you are you out of debt. Yeah, we have uh, my husband and I make really good money. Uh, we have a house loan, and other than that, we're debt free. Um, great cars, all the good stuff, paying for college cash. Um, but way to go! I, yeah. I don't know whether I should. One hundred percent. A lot of things to you. Well, I mean, we, before we got married, we completed your course because oh, that's we great. wanted to do this right. Yeah, I mean, you're going up to fifteen percent, and you're starting with your match. It sounds like. You might make more than a Roth IRA. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max it out. Max what you can out. And yeah. then you Especially can do back. Especially if you got or... a Roth 401k at the new place. Yeah. Is it? So so is that what I should do then? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, take, Roth, take, then... take Roth everything okay. that you can. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay. And and uh, on the new stuff, not the, not the rollover. The rollover is traditional to traditional. Yep. Okay. Yep. The 180, because I don't want that to become taxable right now. But yeah, I'd max mm -hmm. out that Roth, and um, especially if you can get it with a match. And yeah, you're just going to end up with an extra pile of money there that you move when you leave that job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I move that, leave that job, my career will most likely be self employed. Um, and so that's where I'm, I'm trying to kind of get that IRA established, because I think that's where my best retirement is going to be if I've understood correctly. I'm sorry, your best retirement is where? You can you can do all kinds of stuff um, when you're self employed. My R IRA. Okay. Well maybe you that's another Okay, call your then. rollover <laughs> IRA you won't be adding anything to. You'll be opening okay. a new one when you're self employed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be okay. in the same mutual funds with the same broker. Get a Smart Vester Pro to help you do all this. Just click at RamseySolutions.com, find the Smart Vester Pro in your area, sit down. They'll help you arrange all this stuff. So what you're gonna end up with is the O four oh one K rolling over to an IRA, mm -hmm. you're going to open a new Roth 401k with a match, we hope, at the new place. When you leave there, you're going to roll it to a Roth. Mm -hmm. So you'll have those two accounts with account numbers on them. That's right. And then when you're self-employed, you can start doing traditional, I mean, you can do regular Roths, and you can either do a SEP or a simple IRA for your self-employed company, whichever one you want to do. And you can look at all of that at that time. But yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff when you're self-employed uh, to do the same exact, have the same approach as your only difference is you, if you match, you match yourself. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's the only difference. So other than that, you're in great shape. Carrie, you're doing really good stuff. Very good. She's, Excited. she's killing it. Yeah. Asking the right questions. Yeah. Moving in the right way. So here's the thing. Always when you leave your company, folks, Always roll your 401k to an IRA, not to the new company's 401k, because you have more options. You're sitting with your SmartVestor Pro. You've got an account. You're, you're now managing your wealth away from work. Right. And, and it's uh, a transfer, direct transfer. It's not you yeah. pulling it out and then right. putting it into... It's a rollover. It's a direct transfer rollover. That's a good point. Yeah. And so... What Jade is talking about is make sure the money is sent straight to the mutual fund, That's not right. to your house, because they don't you don't want them withholding on it. You want to put the whole thing in there, and um, that's the route to go. This is the Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day, Philippians 1, 6, God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished. John Wooden said, what is right is more important than who is right. Ooh, that'll work. Todd is with us. Todd's in Philadelphia. Hi, Todd. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I got a question on what to do with uh, some proceeds from a life insurance policy. Um, my This is from my late wife's estate, and I got a bunch of money. I put it in a CD last year to kind of hide it from myself, and the CD is maturing in May. I'm trying to figure out if I should use it to pay off the mortgage or to save it, uh, use it for you know somehow in my kids' education or something else for my children. Wow! So she's been gone since May. Since May, yes. I'm sorry. What happened? I'm sorry. Since since June. Since June. Yeah. What happened? I'm sorry. Uh, she had uh, leukemia. It happened very very quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How, how old was she? Uh, 53 years old. Wow. And how much money's in there, Todd? Uh, there's uh, 180000 left. Okay. All right. And what are your options? What are you considering doing with the money? So I have 145000 left on the mortgage. I figured I could, you know, pay it off and, and be done with it. And that's the only debt I have. And the other is to say, you know, keep it for... Uh, my youngest is still in high school. I to put him through college. You know, there was, I might need that. I might not. Or to just you know do something with it for the for the kids somehow. Yeah. yeah. What What do you make? What do I make? Mm-hmm. Uh, about two hundred a year. Okay. All right. So if, if I understand, you have one hundred and eighty. You owe one hundred and forty-five. So if you paid off the mortgage, you have thirty-five left. Plus, you make two hundred yeah. a year to get the youngest through college. Yes, and I'll have a good big save for them, too. I just don't know how much this is going to cost, right? So. Well, I do. It's going to cost $35,000 plus whatever you can come up with out of your budget. That's what it's going to cost. That's where he's going okay. to go to school. We're going to go to school we can afford to go to. Mm-hmm. That would be nice. Yeah. No, it's not nice. It's it's what we're going to do. It's my money. So okay. this is how this works. If you want my money, you're going to go where I want you to go to school. So... Mm-hmm. um. I mean, we'll talk about it, and we can pick a school, but we're probably going to a state school, which is fine, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because we didn't do this with our daughter, you know, but I, I get it. The situation is different you're, you're, now, Hey, Todd, your, your, your phone is awfully muffled. Can you speak directly into it? I'm having trouble hearing you. Yes, I, uh, Much I'm sorry. I, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, you were saying? You know, we didn't do that with our, with our daughter. We kind of let her pick her place, but I recognize the situation is different now. Yeah. So is she out of school? She has one more year, but I, I can handle that. I already yeah. have something for that. And how old is the youngest? What, what year of, of high school? He's uh, 16 years old, uh, junior. Okay, so he's got senior while uh, he's, he's finishing up his junior while your daughter's finishing up her senior year of college. Uh, I know they're both juniors, so one in high school, one in college. Okay, so they're both going to be seniors at the same time then. So you're not going to really get a break. You're going to go from one to the other. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. You're correct. Okay, <laughs> All right, I'm catching on. Okay, and uh, how expensive was her school? Uh, it's uh, 80 a year and no, no aid. Mm-hmm. Okay. All and you right. cash flowed all that? We did. Wow. We did. My wife, Sharon, handled all the finances. She did a wonderful job. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, if you make 200 a year and you don't have any debts, including a mortgage, you can probably pull off just about whatever you want, however you want to prioritize your personal cash flow towards your youngest college. That'll be up to you, mm-hmm. plus or minus 35000 okay. Do you have any other money saved? Yes, I, I do. I do. How much? Um, I... Uh, Probably about, let's say, three, three fifty, three sixty. And that's not retirement savings, right? It is not retirement savings. Okay, so Junior can go to school wherever he wants if you're willing to part with some of that money. He can, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay so that's a that's a value judgment you make. It's a decision you make. So, uh, knowing that we have all of that, that further ensures that we're going to pay off the house. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that way, and I kind of I figured you would you guys were going to say that. But well, you I, got five hundred thousand dollars. Yes. You have five hundred thousand dollars. You only owe one hundred and forty on your house, so it's a no brainer. Pay it off. Okay, I, I I think that's a good idea, and I'm I'm being lean in that way. Yeah, and um and here's the thing: you've been through a a a, a terrible time. And what is hard to anticipate until you've been there, not because I've been there, is that um, it, it's has no, it, it's um, not even in the same category as your the stuff you went through with your wife. But paying off the house is going to be is going to give you a you're physically going to feel peace from getting mm-hmm. rid of that mortgage because it, extra because extra weight just it, even though it's not that much compared to what you make because you've been through so much and y'all have had so much pain and grief. And now when that is cleared, there's a cleanliness to that in the spirit. You're going to feel it. Mm -hmm. I promise. I I, I think you're going to be sitting on the back porch having a cup of coffee and you're going to be going, wow, I did not see that coming. Yeah. I haven't had that in a while. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, you take your shoes off, walk through the backyard. The grass feels different when you own it. When it's paid for, and and it's it's particularly highlighted in a highly uh, emotionally charged situation like what they've been through there. I would I would imagine it gives a sense of closure. You started this journey with someone, yeah. and that included buying a home, and this is the place that we live. And I think that I would imagine that paying it off would give a sense of closure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um, uh, it does, and. and Here's the thing. He said his wife Sharon's good with money. Mm-hmm. I can imagine that she's in heaven smiling. The mm-hmm. house is being paid off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she would want him to have ultimate peace, as much peace yeah. as you can have here yeah. Yeah. on earth. Exactly. In that, in that situation, that's the way to go. Andre is in Seattle. Hey, Andre, what's up? Hi, Mr. Ramsey. I uh, had a quick question for you. Okay. Um Kind of get the feeling, and I know what you're going to say, but I wanted to confirm. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, I um, I think I'm broke, but uh, kind of an interesting situation. <laughs> so, anyways, I have about two hundred five thousand ish of bad debt, not including mortgages, mm-hmm. um, and uh, about sixty four of that, sixty five is cars, fifty five I owe as a personal loan. Mm. Uh, to my father-in-law, and another sixty-four or something oh, on credit cards, and about twenty for the. Andre, Andre, I don't want to be rude, but I'm really short on time. Real quick, oh, what's your yes, question? Sir. Quick, quick, quick question. So, um, my accountant is saying that um, I need to rent out the current place I live right now at least two months out of the year, mm-hmm. uh, so he can do a cost segregation study and save me about twenty grand a year for next year's taxes. Yeah. My question you is: You need a new accountant. Do I buy it? Oh, yeah. When when a tax advisor start giving you economic bad financial advice just to save on taxes, that means you need to fire them. And so, yeah, you need a new accountant. You need to you need to sell that house, dude. You, you're so deep in debt you can't breathe. I think I'm broke, and my accountant is telling me to be in the rental business. Terrible ding, to ding, save ding, twenty thousand. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, get a new get a, get get somebody else. So, folks, the. A hundred percent of the time I see people do something solely for tax reasons and don't and they ignore the economic and the personal finance implications of it. Um, it, It's always a bad move because I hate taxes as bad as anybody else, but I don't want to trade dollars for quarters. And a lot of the tax advice is you're getting a write off and you're trading dollars for quarters. Meanwhile, the guy can't breathe. He's got two hundred thousand dollars in debt and this stupid accountant saying keep a rental property. God, that's dumb. Yeah, get a new CPA. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus.